John Sargent grew up on a cattle ranch in Wyoming. In fact, he got bucked off a horse at age seven and was deeply ashamed of it. And apparently this stuck with you your whole life? It was a Brahma bull calf. The shame was not getting bucked off. The shame was uh, crying. Because it was not, you know, in Wyoming culture, it's just not accepted to cry. And so if you're a guy and you're crying, it's bad. And I just remember being humiliated. You know, the guy dragged me off underneath my arms. The, 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 the calf had run over my back. And uh, I, a lot of pain, and I remember just being dragged off, and I couldn't stop crying, and and just felt oh, just right. terribly ashamed, and and a failure, of course, for being bucked off so goddamn fast. I don't think I lasted a second, Nigel. So, you've never cried since. No, I cry emotionally a lot, uh, unfortunately, and. I mean, this is going to sound terrible. I'm going to sound like a, a I'm going to sound like my age. Uh, right. But, you know, inside, I got the little guy in my head saying to me, God damn it, don't be a girly man, you know, is it is just a every time I, I do it. I don't cry from it's been a long time since I've cried from pain. I'll tell you that. So it's like toxic masculinity. No, I don't I don't think so. It's just a different. You know, you have to be tough. You know, people who don't have experience with it, it's hard to hard to describe. But growing up on a cattle ranch, you have to be tough. Those yeah. guys, they are tough because yeah. you're in physical pain a fair amount of the time. And you have this sort of, you have to keep getting after it no matter what. Uh, you know, the cows have to be fed all winter. It's, it's 50 below zero. It doesn't matter. You know, get up there. Go feed the cows. Um, and there is a, I don't think it's toxic masculinity, but it is serious masculinity, right? It's how strong can you be? How tough can you be um, mentally, and, mentally and physically? They're, uh, they are honored, right? In that culture. And crying just didn't cut it. Crying doesn't cut it. Oh, shit. No. John worked at six publishing companies over 40 years. At age 29, he was the publisher of the children's book division of Simon & Schuster. At 35, he was the CEO of Dorling Kindersley Publishers. For the last two decades of his publishing career, he was the CEO of the company that became today's Macmillan under his guidance. He is the author of three books for children written under a pen name. And he's currently the chairman of the Ocean Conservancy. He lives with his wife, Connie Sargent, in Brooklyn, New York, and they have two adult children. Welcome once again to The Bibliophile. Thank you very much, Nigel. Great pleasure to be here. Some months ago now, you mentioned to me that uh, while you were writing this book, John Delassi, your editor, told you to put more of yourself in it. Why do you think he did that? Oh, well, he's a great editor, Jonathan. You know, he really is. And uh, I had been determined to write a book about uh, the best stories of my working life. And I'd been pretty rigid in that. And, and I wanted to tell the stories. It was to be about the stories. And I was in the stories, right? But it was to be about the stories, and and uh, Jonathan agreed to read to read it for me and to give me advice. And he uh, it was, he was very nice. He read it and he said we should have lunch, and we had lunch. And I uh, and he said you have to put more of yourself in these stories. He said it's good, but you have to put more of yourself. And I said well I don't want to put myself in there. And he said the readers need to know who the narrator is. And I said well I don't want to share with the reader who the narrator is and he said but you have to and i finally in frustration said look jonathan nobody wants to read about little johnny goes west and he reaches his hand over across the table and he puts his his hand on my forearm and he said everybody wants to read about little johnny goes west and i said really and he was like yeah and so he got me pushed me hard in that direction so i put the stories about me and my, you know, I just, I didn't want, 
I, I hate reading these books about people you're interested in as adults. And the first, you know, half of the book is about them growing up. So I just put a little in there. And then everybody who read it, who were editors who read it after that all said the same thing. And then they, I got heavy pressure to put my, I have this sort of distinguished publishing family and I got pressure to put those in. So I wrote the prologue about them and, and a little bit more about me and, it ended up being, you know, I tried to give people the idea of who I was and adding in the stories, you know, what I felt like when, you know, when the stuff with the DOJ was happening and, and, you know, it was in the newspapers all the time and all that, you know, what did that feel like? Uh, mm -hmm. I put more of that stuff in and it did make it a better book. I, you know, I, he was right. I was wrong, but uh, it wasn't easy to do for me. It was interesting. Right. Well, we should mention that the title of the book is Turning Pages, The Adventures and Misadventures of a Publisher. And it's a memoir written as episodic reminiscences, stories, as you say, filled with gentle, self-deprecating humor and anecdotes and references to book people, publishing houses, and key books that you've published uh, over the years. And what I want to get at are the qualities that these people, these books, these publishing houses exhibited and how they exemplify what, what's best in publishing. Okay, let's have okay. that. Okay, you okay yeah. with that? Okay. Uh, before we do that, I should say that I liked the book. I enjoyed reading it. I didn't like the title. Huh, okay. It was a difficult, that was a struggle. To, there was a story, Jonathan Gillespie wanted to call it, there's a story in there about how I met my wife and I, I read a letter from her old boyfriend over her shoulder in the subway. And I, I was never any good with with uh, with sort of female relationship, you know, relationships with women. And uh, I didn't know what to say. And so I sat there and the last line had been, uh, I love you, please come back, Pete. And and I read it over her shoulder and I sat there, she finished the letter and I sat there and I sat there. Finally, I said, so who's Pete? And uh, Jonathan wanted to title the book, Who's Pete? And, <laughs> and Connie really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and we know who won. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was hard to it was hard to title. I didn't know how to I didn't wasn't sure how to title it. Yeah. I thought it was hokey. I thought it was a bit hackneyed. I came Einstein, which is I'll quickly read it, very short. Two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. And I'm not sure about the universe. <laughs> and I think maybe were you catering to the masses like you wanted to explain ex exactly what it, this book was titling something with the word stories in it is sort of known to be the kiss of death you're not supposed to do that right so if stories is out uh, how do you describe what the book is and then turning pages is simply uh you know, it's a book metaphor, and yeah, it's a yeah. it's a little bit it's 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 an obvious okay book metaphor yawn. Um, but if you if you look at how to convey what it is, uh, you know, it's cliche turning the pages of your life or whatever. But it is a sort of process you go through in writing and reading, right? Both, and it did to me. The important part was the word adventures when doing the title. And my publisher added misadventures. He wanted to add misadventures. And I thought, fine, because there's a bunch in there that is misadventures. Um, and I thought, that's good. Um, so I thought the subhead really worked. And what you just needed was sort of a two or three word mm uh, at the top. And so turning pages, you know, big type. It says what the book is. That cover image yeah. is a sculpture that my daughter made me out of my favorite, one of my favorite books. Leaving Cheyenne by Larry McMurtry. She made that sculpture and, okay. and my wife took the picture of the book uh, of the sculpture. Uh, and then you think, you know, turning pages with all the pages turning personal because the image is, uh, you know, it was made for me by my daughter. Yeah. 
and the white color yeah. is is a bit of an ode to only you will uh, grasp this fully. Nigel is a bit of an old ode to my great grandfather who wrote the book called that he called the White Book yeah. and that was never published, but uh, it's called the White Book and a bit of an ode to DK. The the design was a bit of an ode to Dorian yeah. Kennedy. So there was a lot of sort of emotional content, oddly enough, in that cover. But I agree with you. the The title is in it. The only good news is it was also the 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 previous person who used that title. I discovered after I had the first design of the book in was a Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. So I, I think I'm in good company there, at least, and a liberal one at that. Yeah. Okay. You were fascinated by World War II and courage. Yeah. Why is that? I don't know. It's, it's uh, you know, I was growing up, you know, in the 60s and World War II was not that long ago. And it was, you know, it was heroic. It was the good guys versus the bad guys. And it was it was incredibly human, you know, in every way. It was incredibly human. And to me, in its scale. Right. So it was men you know charging at each other with guns and there were the good guys bad guys the good guys win at the end of the day it's very compelling if you're you know young male and and you know the culture you're growing up in her, heroism is a big thing physical yeah. toughness is a big thing uh and i had i thought it was fantastic uh world war ii just i mean it's a fantastic story world war ii i read about both you know a Pacific theater, European theater, and I, I'm still reading about it today. It's it's still a good story. The the personal level, it's great. And then, you know, as it turned out, I had um, two stepfathers who were extremely brave in World War II. One an actual stepfather and one a uh, common law husband or whatever you would call it. Right. And so, so you, you wanted to display your own courage somehow? Yeah, of course. I I don't know if that's common uh, among young males in particular, but the the urge to to be brave when the chips are down, uh, mm -hmm. to perform well, be brave, is is strong. It was strong in me, and and the problem is you do, you never know if you're going to have it until you're in a situation where the chips are down, yeah. right? Yeah. And there's no way to know. So. You imagine yeah. you're a, a young a young guy. You're I don't know. I was in my early teens, teens uh, into my twenties. You're reading about all these incredibly heroic guys and what they have done, and then you say, you know, would I stack up? Yeah. You know, would I be the guy who got out of the foxhole, or would I be the guy sort of hunkered down in the foxhole? And you never know. I mean, it's a it's a good story. It's also a horrific story. Terrible, yeah. Terrible. Yeah. As a story, it's good, right? As a yep. beginning, middle, end, you know, lots of emotion, guys you could really, really hate in every way, guys mm -hmm. who were heroic on both sides, bad guys on the good side, good guys on the bad side. It's a, you know, it's a good story. Well, the wars are, you know, when we look at history, what do we study the most? We study the wars, right? And we also were interested in love. So you get a lovely story, and you you referenced it uh, a few minutes ago about your future wife on on the number one train. Yeah. You describe her as being effortlessly, effortlessly yeah. beautiful. That that's just a, a lovely little phrase. I I worked on that. I yeah. I tried to think what made her different. From, you know, New York City, there's a lot of very pretty, very beautiful women. Um, and, you know, she wasn't wearing any makeup. She wasn't, her hair was pretty standard. She was, you know, not trying. She didn't have fancy clothes on. She wasn't, there was none of that. She was just being herself, sitting on the train. And she was beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So I, I tried to, I actually worked quite hard on, that was probably the, I don't know, I don't I tried not to use many adjectives. I I wanted an adjective there and I I worked hard to try to figure out what was the right adjective for that and effortlessly is what I came up with. 
Thank you for appreciating it. You also followed that up with uh, that she was significantly above your pay grade. I like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still is. <laughs> well, that's another thing I want to touch on 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 that and and loyalty and and publishing. I'm going to try and weave in references okay. to what what's required of a great publisher, but. Let's just get into some of the the people that you sketch. This is Jerry Weatherall, and I believe he's he was in charge of the royalty department. Yeah, Doubleday in Garden City. The, right, and you you call the royalty department the complex underbelly of publishing, where debit and credit determine the size of the checks the authors receive. What what's so complex about that? Oh, so uh, if you can imagine, if it's a big publishing house, you have literally thousands of authors. Each author has a separately negotiated contract with all these different agencies with agents. Also, some direct with the publisher, some historic ones. The contracts have changed greatly over all the years. Right. And then sales are treated. All the different types of sales that happen for books are treated differently for royalty. So export sales, foreign translations, mass market sales. Books have three or four different formats, all with different royalty schedules. And so in comes all this information. And the one thing you must never do as a publisher is miscalculate an author's royalty. That's the one thing you you can miscalculate your income taxes, but do not miscalculate author royalty because it is your fiduciary responsibility to make sure they get paid for their work. So you defend copyright, you push them. Your whole purpose is to get the author's work out to the reader mm -hmm. and to pay them for it. And you have to pay them the right amount. Now, you can overpay them. That's not a problem, no. but you can't underpay them. You really can't. They think that they're being underpaid most of the time, right? Most of the time, but it is so complex. It's really hard. The The amount of information coming in uh, into all these different sort of calculations by multiple types of, you think of the, if you have a book translated into 23 languages, right? Yeah. The dollar conversions of the price points, the, I mean, the mass of numbers. And at the end of the day, it all, all those numbers meet at the royalty department. And it's complicated. So Jerry Weatherall was really good at what? Okay, so the royalty department has a couple, often interfaces with authors and agents, because agents say, you know, well, you know, I got the royalty statement and I don't understand this. And they call up and they ask. So the guy at the end of the day who's responsible for those calls, the editors don't know how it's calculated. So at the end of the day, it bounces to the head of the royalty department. He's got to explain to the business manager, to the agent, to the author, how those numbers were calculated and why they're correct. And as you can imagine, they track if there's problems with an author, if an author needs a change in their advance for this reason or that reason. They document it, right? So they have lots and lots of information about <laughs> authors. <laughs> okay. And, and Jerry was... Weatherall was this this fantastic, you know, older gentleman, very understated, very proper, and you know, would never let on anything. But if you got to know him and he trusted you, you discovered that he knew. I mean, I ran into him with James Baldwin, right? And and he knew more about James Baldwin's personal life than <laughs> I, than I imagine some of Baldwin's family knew. I mean, because he right. would get these requests. In those days, the authors would do these requests, and the editor would attach the author request and send it to him. And he'd right. save all the stuff, and every once in a while, apparently, James would call him personally. You know, he was like, the, like an ATM for James Baldwin. He ran out of cash. He'd call Jerry. He'd say, Jerry, I need cash for this reason. So anyway, it was, I, I don't know, I, I found the guy utterly fantastic. 
So brilliant organizer. Yeah, he's an accountant, organizing guy, but a, a yeah. fantastic human as well. As you find in publishing, well, you know, as Nigel, as you find in publishing houses all over the place, right? Yeah. yeah. The guys behind the scenes are are compelling. Yeah. Another Jerry, Jerry Kaplan at uh, Macmillan said to you that moving from sales to the business side is just stupid. Yeah. What about Jerry Kaplan? And why is it stupid? Jerry was Jerry was uh, just trying to see how I reacted to pressure. And, and, you know, he just, from when I walked into the interview until the interview got to the end, he just relentlessly tried to make me incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> and uh, he was good at it, you know, and I was uncomfortable. But it does give him, a, you know, can this guy think under pressure is is a yeah. good thing to find out. And and I was already sort of a a business guy, sort of mid-level business guy. And and uh, and he I think he just his mind didn't work like a standard mind. He didn't have a linear. He, he didn't think linearly. I mean, he would never he used the Socratic method. You come in and say, Jerry, I'm having this terrible problem. I can't figure this out. And he just start to ask you questions. He wouldn't give you an answer, which could have been just was incredibly frustrating, right? But you learn more because he just kept asking you questions until you yourself figured out the right answer. If you were smart, and there's a lot of people who never could figure out what the hell Jerry was talking about and were just hugely frustrated, didn't like working for the guy. I would be frustrated, but I always thought he there was kindness in it. I, I could see that he's being kind. He wanted to teach. He mm -hmm. wasn't doing it so he could prove, you know, he was smarter than you are or any of that stuff. He was, uh, I'll give you an example of, of uh, Jeremiah Kaplan. I, I went into his office once. I, I had some stuff that really was important. I walked in his office and he's reading and he doesn't look up. And he weighs me to a chair and he's reading. And I look and he's reading a dictionary. And I say to him, Jerry, you're reading a dictionary. And he said, yeah. I said, tell me, why are you reading a dictionary? And he looks at me dead in the eye without smiling and says, how else could you possibly know if a dictionary is any good if you don't read it? You know, what? <laughs> it's true, but it, it sort of, it blows your mind, right? Jerry's going to sit and read an entire dictionary to come to the conclusion if it's good or not. Anyway, he was a different, he was a different sort of guy and a remarkable man. And he had, that guy had faith in me when no, when my family didn't, when a lot of people didn't, that guy always had faith in me. Always. Had a pretty good vocabulary. He did. Uh, okay. So Dick Schneider. Oh. He was spectacular, but uh, by all reports, you know, he every year he made the top ten toughest bosses in the in the United States. I think it's Forbes magazine always published the top ten toughest bosses. He was always on it, and man, he could be so nasty to people. <laughs> I mean, just you know, his his face would get red, and he'd scream, and the and the veins would pop out on his head, and he'd. He'd just yell at you and just belittle the hell out of you. I mean, really seriously belittle you and in front of people. And, you know, you'd just be, wow. You know, it's in the book. I had a, I had a boss at, when I worked for Jerry McMillan and, and when I went to follow Jerry to Simon & Schuster, you know, he said, you're going to work for Dick Snyder. He said, I'll give you a, a word of advice. He's a little guy and he's bully. So, you know, if he, if he gives you any trouble, just make like you're going to pop him and, uh, you know, get close to him and crowd him and, uh, and, you know, physically, and physically, physically. physically intimidate the guy because he's a bully and that he'll understand. And, you know, so I went to SNS and I'm, I'm watching at one point Snyder going off at somebody. And, and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, he does that to me. What am I going to do? And I planned out exactly what I was going to do. If Snyder went off at me, I knew exactly what I was going to do. And I think because I did, he never went off at me. 
he never did. Uh, you know, he'd get after me and then I'd, I'd start to do what I had planned to do and things would calm down pretty quick. Which is what? Get close to him physically? No, no. I was going to, uh, I was going to um, put my chin out and stick my chest out and ball my fist at my side. That was the plan. And then uh, I was going to tell him in, you know, measured tones, Dick, you know, if you're going to speak to me this way, I'm out of here. I'm going back to my desk now. It'll be cleaned out. I'll be out of the building in a half an hour. And then I was going to stand up and walk out. But it never got to that. No, he never, he never, he was never nasty to me. He, he was tough with me a couple times, but he never did the personal thing with me that he did with others that I saw him do with others. He never did. The nastiest he ever got was I had done the education group a favor and had, you know, let them use a bunch of children's books with sort of, you know, use these books and put them in the educational textbooks to increase the thing. And, and I, made them a very good business deal. They were in the same company. I'd made them a very good business deal. And Snyder called me in and said, uh, what, I see this deal that you did with the education guys. Uh, why did you do that? And I said, well, they need the books, same company. I get exposure and, and I wanted to help them out, you know, financially as well. He said, I don't pay you to be concerned with other people's p and in the company, I pay you to be concerned with your P and L, and you should you got to stop being concerned with anybody else and stop right now. And that was uh, the moment he said it to. I remember sitting in his office. He and you know he's saying it with a real intensity. I'm looking at him. I thought I better go find another place to work. So was he a good publisher or not? Hell yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. But Famously, he sounds like you know, a, like a of, complete jerk. Yeah, but tough. And, and you know, for, you know, it, I I wasn't there for it. But, you know, one of the guys who was in the room uh, told me the story of of when he stood up in front of the sales conference. He's a CEO. He mm-hmm. got up in front of the sales force and said, you need to put this book out because with this book, we're going to bring down the president of the United States. And it was all the president's men. You don't have to be a nice guy to be a good publisher. He recognized books and he was an gr- aggressive marketer of books. Did a good job building it. SNS was a small company when he came and it was a big company when he left. He did a good job building it. You could say he destroyed a lot of value. You could say he created a lot of value. It depends how you look at it. He had charisma. He was a big personality, uh, yeah. which is no doubt about it. Um, he was also, a, you know, a very difficult man. Let's move from that to Chicka Chicka Boom Boom. Yeah. I read that book probably every night for I don't know how many years. Right. It's a fantastic book, isn't it? Well, the, my daughter sure loved it. Yeah. <laughs> and what you say about that book is that uh, children's book is it brings good in the world and made money, a perfect combination. It was very, very good at teaching uh, ABCs, early education. It the the two authors and the illustrator working together figured out a way to make a b c d e f g h i j k l m the alphabet memorable right is it, it's which musical or a melody or like it it, uh, it just rolled off the tongue that's that's it you you got it that's exactly yeah. what made that book magic is that it was uh, and and the very best of the early childhood reading books, think of Dr. Seuss, right? When you read them, you pay attention to the internal syllable by syllable rhyming and syllable by syllable sound. So when you say, when A told B and B told C, I'll meet you at the top of the coconut tree, your voice always goes coconut tree. Mm -hmm. It just does. But you say coconut, <laughs> coconut. But when yeah. you do it with those syllables, you go coconut tree, right? Those syllables, the way they put them together, were both entertaining, but also made your voice sound like a song when you yeah. read it, which is why yeah. kids love it. Right. It's an amazing book. 
Well, you said I had an immediate sense of wonder, a rare moment when you see something new and different. And as you said, the text seemed magical. Yeah. It is the great joy of publishing, Nigel, is when you read a book that's different from anything you've ever read or seen before. And you realize after all these millions of books over all these years, someone was come up with a new idea, a new way to look at something, mm -hmm. a new plot, yeah. a new something that's absolutely original. It's just fantastic, you know, when you see it. Well, this uh, this sense of wonder, is it, it's like it's just a palpable kind of a, something that hits you, right? That when you saw it. Oh, yeah, I, I remember I, I remember absolutely clear as a bell when, when that book came in, they had them spread out on a conference room table and it was spread by spread and the art was much bigger than the art is in the book. So you imagine that book blown up big and it was all original art and I just looked at it and you just went, wow, wow, it covered the whole table. And then you read it, and it was like, oh, you know, whoa, it, off the charts. It just it, it, immediate and, again, awestruck, you know, sort of sat there in silence looking at it like, whoa, yeah. Yeah. look at that. Yeah, you knew you had something remarkable, as you say. Yeah. You tell the story of Ken Geist refusing to shave. Yeah. For the two of you. Yeah. And that is because you believed in this book so much that you would go to any length? Yeah. So Barnes & Noble wouldn't take the book. And, you know, I, I called the buyers down there who I was friendly with and went down to see them, and they refused to take it. They refused from the sales reps, and they refused from me, and there was no way to go further. Um, and we knew without distribution, the book wasn't going to make it at the level it, it could make it. And Ken came up with the idea, not me. He said, what happens, what would happen if we grew beards and wouldn't shave them until we sold the book to Barnes & Noble? I thought, well, shit, I don't have a plan B. So <laughs> you do, so let's try it. And uh, God, we did. And it was it was weeks and weeks. <laughs> we had long beards. And then they top beards? ZZ top? Yeah, no, no, it, it it got to be about, I don't know, this long and, and woolly looking as hell. And, and uh, Snyder, Dick Snyder, in those days, anybody who worked at a corporate level job, you did not have a beard, right? And Snyder got me at a dinner one night and said, you know, Sergeant, are you, you, you know, you, you must be having an affair. And I said, that, Dick, what the hell are you talking about? And he said, there's only one reason a man your age grows a beard. And it's because you're having an affair. I said, Dick, I'm not having an affair. And I'll have you know, I'm growing his beard to sell some more copies of one of your books. You know, I had some attitude with him. And he he did not back off a bit. He said, you shave that off, Sergeant, and you shave it off now. It's not funny. It's not entertaining. Shave it like that. And I was like, oh, shit. So I went back to Ken and I said, Ken, we're in desperate straits. Um, and we agreed we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't shave and, and you know, we'd risk the career. Um, and then, then I don't know, it was the next day or the day after that, we decided we'd, we'd cut off half of our beards each. We did. We stood side by side and I had beard on one side. He had beard on the other. So we had the one beard between us. We took the picture of our two faces just mashed together with this one beard and a final pleading note to Barnes and & Noble. And, and they ended up taking, you know, God, incredible numbers of books. They probably took... Uh, I want to say 30 per store for every store in the chain and put them all on a big table. And, and it's been there ever since. It's just, it's just you know, fantastic for me. Uh, fantastically rewarding. You know, every, yeah. every week I wrote them a letter to say, you know, something humorous about our beards. That's interesting. Okay. So how much did the book sell itself or how much of this, this sort of humor? Yeah, this is publishing, right? This is the very essence of publishing. The author creates something, and then the publisher's job is to get it out to the readers. And the best publishing is creative, dogged, determined, never give up, do whatever it takes, get that book right. into people's hands. Now, 
once it's out, the book sells itself, as we saw. I mean, that was and it took off from there. And I mean, it took off and it's never it's never stopped. It's still I was in Barnes and Noble two weeks ago. They have a new Barnes and Noble out where I live. And and I went in there and it's still there. You know, it's still in it's still in Barnes and Noble today. So <laughs> that's the best of publishing is right when someone or someone's in a publishing house say we're not going to give up until this book works and if you're lucky and you're an author you have someone who does that for you yes. you've done the hard work which is writing the book but you need help it's a group exercise getting a book to succeed is a group exercise and you say you're proudest of that book i think that one and being mortal by atul gawande is uh you know, the yeah. sort of rules I put for myself to be proud of a book is I have to have something to do with its success personally, and it has to sell a lot of copies, and it has to do good in the world. Dorling and Kindersley, I never really realized that it was a bit like Amway, this publishing house. <laughs> no, that was only one arm of it, right? It was a standard publisher, first distributed by Random right. House. Then when I went there, we had just started publishing in the United States. It was a British publisher. We'd started publishing in the United States. And the vast majority of the business was just like any other publishing house. It was the very beginning of Amazon, actually. It was Amazon came up about halfway through my time at DK. Jeff started it in his garage, you know. We sold through all the different channels of distribution. We, we sold it every way. But then Peter wanted more shelf space as it were right he we had these fantastic books they sold really well and if you could put them in front of people people would buy them mm -hmm. but you know walmart wasn't willing to give more than x square you know linear feet to them nor was anyone else and as we grew the backlist kept growing the, and we were publishing a ton of books and we, no store could afford to give us enough space because the nonfiction section, the children's section were all reasonably small. And so he said, you know, how are we going to do it? And he came up with this direct to consumer, sort of like Amway or Tupperware or any of those. And, okay. you know, he started it. We, we hired a guy from, uh, from Tupperware uh, named Alan Luce, and we set up in Florida. We set up systems in the warehouse. So it was shipping direct to consumer. And it was a multi-level marketing organization. And it had all the traits of a marketing, multi-level marketing organization. It's a completely different way to sell product. It, I mean, that was successful for a while, but it didn't really last, right? Yeah. So what, what happens with multi-level marketing organizations is they have to have a charismatic leader. And Kindersley was the charismatic leader. And that worked. And... People were devoted and there were thousands and thousands of people who yeah. were selling yeah. these books across America. And what they have to have is complete and total trust in the organization. That's what they have to have. And uh, after I left, there was some policy they changed uh, and it was to give free freight, I think. And it made it financially very difficult. Because if you imagine selling one book at a time, free freight uh, is a real problem unless you have tremendous scale. Uh, so it became financially very troublesome. And then they changed some of the terms, which made the network sort of question whether, you know, that was fair. And then it, it just imploded on itself. It shrunk. And then it became, as it shrunk, it became unprofitable and they had to close it. It was an experience. So it was like nothing in publishing. The way you describe the meetings, it's like you're evangelical, isn't it? Oh, it was entirely evangelical. It was really interesting to watch what happened because Peter Kindersley was treated like God, you know? The audience would scream when he walked across the stage, you know? And they'd yeah. be jumping up in the air with their arms in the air going, yes, 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 you know? And it was like, oh, whoa, people, you know? It was very, it was intense. Yeah. Now, this is the most troublesome thing I came across in your book. And that is that your favorite meal is a quarter pounder. How, how often do you eat these things? Not much anymore. Um, but boy, I used to eat a lot of quarter pounders. I would guess from when McDonald's started until probably, uh, I don't know, call it 10 years ago, I ate a lot of quarter pounder. <laughs> I, had a lot. I, don't, I don't want to say how many nights. It was a, a bit embarrassing. You, you strike me as like a, a kind of healthy, focused guy, though. 
Yeah, but I, I, uh, if you grow up on a cattle ranch, what you eat is meat. No, I don't, you eat meat. <laughs> there, it wasn't about vegetables. You sometimes had potatoes, but mostly you ate meat. Right. I just want to talk uh, a bit about the Flatiron Building. You, you have some good things to say about that. You start off by saying, and my next job a few years later was to take all publishing companies we owned in America and make them into a group. We called it Holtzbrink Publishers, but no one could spell Holtzbrink, and it certainly it doesn't roll off the tongue. So a few years later, we we bought back our venerable publishing name, Macmillan, and used it for the U.S. entity. We split off Tor from the St. Martins. We brought in Farrar Strauss and Henry Holt, both of which Holt Brink had previously purchased. And we made Picador a group-wide paperback line. We built a warehouse. We formed a group-wide sales organization. And we started an audiobook division. We created a children's book group. We created new adult publishers and new imprints. We invested in the production, IT, and infrastructure of the company. For more than 20 years, we grew faster than the industry every year but three. We published great books. By 2012, we became one of the big five publishers. On the higher education side of the business, based outside of the Flatiron, we did the same sort of thing with the same sort of results. That was the easy part. In the Flatiron building, the elevators could not be fixed. Yeah, it was sort of you're trying to build this great company. At the same time, you're trying to make the Flatiron building livable. I mean, when I started there, I, I ended up, I ended up walking up 18 flights every morning, every time at lunch and every time I left the building because the elevator would take like seven minutes to right. get up from the lobby to my office. It was it was crazy. Every time you went out for a quarter pounder. Yeah, exactly. When I'd go yeah. to McDonald's, which was about a half block away, it took me longer to get up and down the elevator than it did to get to McDonald's and get my quarter pounder. The infrastructure of that building was just terrible. What made it so odd was the outside was so spectacular. I was going to say it, that the photographs of that building are iconic. It's such a it's, gorgeous building. It is, but they used to claim it was the most photographed building in the world. I spent some time trying to figure out what made it, makes it visually compelling. And it's the shape of the thing is it's not a pure triangle, right? It 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 is it is a pure triangle in that it's three points, but it, it's not a uh, it's not equal sided. Right. I saw you know, one side it's is a an right isosceles. angle. Yeah, it's an isosceles triangle, but and sort of slightly off shape wise in the and it's also narrower at the top than it is at the bottom, and it narrows at a uneven pace. So it narrows more as it gets higher. Each floor gets narrower and narrower as it gets higher. You know, the columns up at the top and, and my the floor where I had my office last, I don't know, 14 years, uh, 19th floor was made to be the corporate floor by the Fuller Brush Company when they built the place. And uh, it had 14 foot ceiling and arched windows and had this little outside balcony. I mean, it was like a some sort of fairy tale thing. And yeah. then, of course, the bathrooms didn't work. You couldn't get hot water. The yeah. elevators didn't work. <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. But you so stuck with it, it, though. When it got cold out, the furnace would run out of steam around noon, and they'd have to turn it off. They, they would never admit it. Sonny would never admit it. But they'd turn it off in order for it to, you know, recover itself. And, you know, the temperature in your office would drop, you know, 25 degrees in an hour. And the windows were all, you know, historically protected windows. So they were all, you know, they were they were from 1890s, right? That's when it was finished in 1902, I think. So y y those are old windows. And the breeze had come right through. Yeah. It was wild. What a great building, though. Did you ever use the image of the building on your logo? We, like we did finally when I, I hired Bob Miller to, to run a new imprint. He wanted to call it Flatiron Books and... 
he he was like a dog with a bone. He would not accept no. And a, a guy had the name and he ended up he ended up swapping the guy. He published his book in order to get the name, to use the name, to be Flatiron Books. And that, oh, was, right. that was then on the logo. So <laughs> that's how Flatiron Books uh, got the name Flatiron Books. Is Bob just, he, he wanted so much to have his new imprint have the Flatiron name that he figured out a way to get it done. And, and his right. logo is a picture of the Flatiron. Beautiful. You referenced the struggle between Google and book publishers and authors over digital scanning. Yeah. What, what was your involvement in that? So uh, that was the Association of American Publishers. So the publishers got together and agreed that they we had to stop Google from doing this. The Authors Guild did the same thing on the author side. And we sued Google to stop them from copying all the books. And Richard Sarnoff and I were uh, asked by the publishers to be the lead negotiators with Google. So Richard, Richard and I spent eight, Richard spent seven before he left the business. I spent eight years being the lead negotiators for the publishers on protecting copyright in the digital age. And it was lots and lots and lots of work. If you can imagine being in a room with, you know, five publishers, three authors, uh, the head of the American Association of the American Association of Publishers, the head of the Authors Guild, four guys from Google, and meeting for two hours break, two hours break, two hours break for two or three days uh, every few months. They basically wanted to go in and and scan everything in some of the great big libraries. They did. And that they were doing threatened it. your backfit. No, what they're doing is. Um, the idea was a great idea, which was they wanted to copy every book on earth ever published in every language and make the contents available for every human being on earth to read for free. That right, was like the that. initial goal. And right. the goal is fine, except for the for free part which is not right. very good for publishers or authors. It was clear out of copyright works, they could copy them and do it what they wanted with them. But in copyright works, they said, well, tell you what, uh, we'll copy them. And then if you have a problem, you can come and tell us which books you have a problem with. And yeah. we're like, no, that's not the way it works. <laughs> You're not allowed to copy them. And so we, we actually worked out an agreement, actually three agreements, I think, from beginning to end. One got thrown out in court and one, you know, we, we finally made it all the way to the end and got an agreement with them for out of copyright and in copyright and out of print, but in still in copyright works and, and uh, what the royalties would be, what would be paid and, and all that stuff. So, and, you know, an opt in as opposed to an opt out uh, thing and, and all that. So, but it was a lot of work. And how much did the lawyers make out of all this? Oh, Jesus, millions, <laughs> millions and millions. It was it was really complicated. It was with, a, you know, we had to involve the Department of Justice, the Library of Congress, the administration, Congress. And it was it was uh, it was a big, complicated uh, thing. When Monica Lewinsky shopped her book around. Yeah. The the entire top brass of your company went to meet her. Sally, Richard, and Bob Wallace, three of us. But but top, top brass going to meet her because you must have figured to to put that kind of man slash woman power into that meeting, it you must have figured this is going to be huge. No, that's it's actually common practice, right? So when when big books come up by celebrities and you know the advance is going to be really big. Being the CEO of the company, you get you have the green light, right? Everybody knows you have the green light. So the agents want you in the room, the authors want you in the room, and most of all, your publisher wants you in the room. Yeah. So they don't have to convince you so that you actually see the author so you get excited yourself. When there when there's going to be a big book, generally speaking, the the person who has the final green light goes and and you know sometimes at random house i don't know if marcus went or didn't go i i, I don't know across the board who went and didn't go but 
generally speaking, if it was going to be millions of dollars in an author advance, the CEOs yeah, yeah. would go, top people yeah. would go. And I, it's interesting, the point you make about her being kind of unpopular, but you still, and I'm trying to remember now, you you didn't win the bid, but she liked you guys. No, it was, uh, we didn't win. Uh, I was really surprised only two publishers came in with serious numbers. We lost. We got a call from the agent the next day saying you'd still be interested. We said, what happened? And they said, the other publisher, they're, she's too unpopular. They wouldn't, they decided yeah. they, they wouldn't publish it because it would be just too difficult because she was so unpopular. We said, great. And I resisted the urge to say, well, how about we take our advance down a little bit then? We right. stuck with the number we had put in and and uh, and we published the book. Yeah, that's what that's the point I'm making though, is that you have a history of enabling uh, and obviously you've got a nose for how to make money, but you you also want to give people the opportunity to air their side of the story, regardless of who it is. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, Monica is, Monica is a remarkable story, right? Because Monica was vilified. Now, if you look at Monica Lewinsky, for many people, she's a hero. Making the judgment call today, if you were to publish Monica Lewinsky today, everybody in the publishing house would cheer for you. Yeah. All the people yeah. who are, you know, culturally sensitive, all, all, everybody would say, of course, we're publishing Monica. But in right. those days, everybody was saying no. And, and so it's instructive, right? So yeah. the people that today people are saying they shouldn't be published because they're not on the right side of this issue or that issue, it changes. Well, with the satanic verses, again, that sort of emphasized to you the importance of free speech and the power of a novel. That's what you said. Yeah, yeah. The the I wasn't involved with the publishing of it. It's published no. But you I did get involved with somehow with uh, Rushdie. At, yeah, uh, I published Rushdie later on. We published Rushdie. Yeah. yeah, The Ground Beneath Her Feet we published. So I think the at the end of the day, it was heady stuff, right? It was a bit terrifying uh, but for the people at Viking. But, you know, the, the fact that there was a fatwa against, it wasn't, if you read the fatwa, it wasn't just against Salman. It was against the editors and the publishers who were involved with yeah. publishing it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a guy, a translator in Japan was was murdered uh, in one of the Nordic countries. One of his publishers was shot. And so you had this sense of this is freedom of speech right here. Right. Salman's not backing off. He's willing to put his life on the line. He's not wanting to pull the book. He's wanting to keep going. His publisher is putting all those employees at risk. Everybody in the company's at risk. Bookstores are keeping it out. Even you know there were places that were getting bombed and stuff. They were keeping the books in place. This was you know this was freedom of speech was a price you know a serious price. It wasn't talk. It was a price. And uh, so I you know I found it very inspiring to me. It was one of the sort of formative things in my sort of view of freedom of speech. And Salman was um, you know the guy went into hiding for all those years and. Uh, I don't know. I just I really respected the way he handled himself from beginning to end on it. And I and I respected his publisher, Peter Mayer. I respected for the way he handled it. So I was a, a bit of a Salman fan. I got to know the guy a little bit. I like he's a fun guy. Yeah, it's a funny Salman, story. Salman, yeah. Salman knows how to have fun. You couldn't get out to the Playboy party. <laughs> oh, I know. I, and, you know, it was a looking back. It's a regret, you know, because the picture in the paper him the next day, he's a short guy. <laughs> And he's yeah. kind of between these two Playboy bunnies and they got the ears <laughs> on and they're they're each about six inches taller than him. And he's got this big grin on and he's telling me how great the jacuzzi was. And, you know, oh, my goodness. Well, linking back though, to the Second World War, yeah. that's what it was fought about. It was fought about freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is sort of the fundamental aspect of a, of a democracy, right? right? It doesn't work without it. Now, I mentioned that you were self-deprecating throughout this uh, memoir, and you tell the story of Jeffrey Archer. <laughs> he wasn't featured in an Apple device. He was some pissed. <laughs> and then 
he gives you he has a shit fit and gives you hell yeah for that not happening yeah and then he says you have to respect a man who can take a battering like that yeah. and then no concerns regarding <laughs> regarding his personal appearance or <laughs> absolutely no interest in clothes whatsoever well that that is what he that is what he he wrote i'm actually a big jeffrey archer fan he's a complex man right there there's times when he's he's tough to take like when he's you know just absolutely battering you battering was about the right word it's like ego management as a as a great publisher you oh, have yeah. to be able to you have to be able to take that from an you author are, right you, you aren't the focus it's the author right. right and in my belief and if the author is going to be really mad i mean there's that little section of the book where i talk about the 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 folks who have gotten really mad right when they get mad, your job is to get to the end of that anger and have a productive outcome. And mm -hmm. you're, you're, it's not about your ego. It can't be for you to be, if you want to be great working with creative talent, it's got to <laughs> be about the creative talent. It can't be about you. Yeah. And it was funny about the not, God, I want to say maybe six, six, seven months ago, uh, I had a back and forth on email with Jeffrey and he was still bugging me to come to the house of Lords. So Mm -hmm. he, he wants me to come to lunch in the house of lords and he knows i'm not going to show up looking good so i take that as a i take that as a vote of approval from jeffrey so self-deprecating and also good at making friends you're good at making friends yeah. right that you talk tell the story of this book that's written by jim hatfield about bush yeah. and and a cocaine habit he may have had yeah. And then you talk about the fact that you could call your friend Benita Summerfield. Yeah. Tell me a bit about a publisher's need to to have a great network. Um, if you're a curious human being, uh, which I am, you know, people are fascinating. Right. And so. One of the great things about publishing is everybody, everybody, you know, there's a ton of people who want to write a book and there's a ton of people who do write books and the people who work in books are fascinating too. So if you go through life being interested in people, you make friends with them. And, you know, I'm a, I'm an outgoing guy. I, I like folks and I never, I never wanted to have, you know, the network to use and the Rolodex to use. It, for me, it wasn't that way. And I never did that. The, the Nita thing, we, we had worked together under Dick Snyder. We had both been through that that grind with Dick. And uh, so we were we were pals. And I called her up to get advice. I called right. her up to say, you know, Benita, I she was connected somehow to Barbara Bush. Yeah, right? she ran she ran all the literacy campaigns for all the Bushes. So she was Barbara right. Bush's head of Barbara Bush Literary Foundation. And she did uh, uh, George's Jeb's. Florida campaign. She did all their, the Bush family was big on literacy and Benita was their literacy person. Uh, and she did literacy at uh, Simon and Schuster too. And so I just called Benita and said, George Bush, this was the first president Bush 41. His attorney called me and said he, she was authorized to use whatever means necessary to stop the publication of the book. And I said, Benita, is that okay? I don't think that's okay. Do you think that's okay? And Benita said, I don't think it is okay. You know, you can't, you can't have a former president saying whatever means necessary. I mean, the first thing that came no, to mind no. when she said it was, this guy used to run the CIA. Yeah. <laughs> what does yeah, what yeah. whatever means necessary mean? Well, it's mafia talk. Someone with the, you know, the, the poison umbrella going to bump into me, you know, um, and it was obvious choice of language. It wasn't like she said it casually and had made it up. She knew exactly what she was saying. And I thought, you know, that's that's intimidation, a, an attempt at intimidation that just can't possibly be okay. You know, the, the choice was to blow it up in the media and say, you know, this has been said to me and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, no, no, the, the right way to do this is... If Benita doesn't think it's okay, 
maybe Benita will go to George and say, hey, you know, your attorney has said this and you know what? Mm, you might, that language might be a little too much for this. And and she was great at it. She was really good. She And she enjoyed doing it. She got in the middle and, you know, she called me and say, well, John, you know, what's the book going to say about this and this? And and I said, well, what does he want? And they, she said, could we have a look at the book beforehand? And normally you don't do that. I thought, well, that, you know, that's fair. And then they asked if he could put his, um, his point of view in the book. And I, I got to the editor and I said, get to the author. Is the author okay with this sentence? I think it's fine. Is the author okay with this sentence? And it was something like, you know, the Bush family says this never happened or something like that. Yeah. And the author was totally fine with it. And so we put it in the book and that whole thing blew over. Maybe I'm mixing these books up because uh, is that the Jim Hatfield book? Yeah, that's the Jim Hatfield book. Then what happened after that yeah. is when the book came out, that whole part was about the fact that George Bush had told his son, it's going to be problematic you marrying a woman of Hispanic when he had a Hispanic girlfriend. That was what the problem was with George Bush. Then when the book came out, there was the cocaine thing in it. Yeah. Then that blew up. But before the cocaine thing, there was this other thing. <laughs> you know, I look back at it and think, you know, I'm not proud of that. I made, I made at the end of the day, I made reasonable decisions given what I knew. But at the end of the day, I was wrong. Trusted your author, right? I trusted the author 100%. And... And, you know, as it turns out, I shouldn't have. This was very sad because he ends up committing suicide. Yeah. It's slimy politics because he was told by Carl Rove, I think you say. That's that what he always claimed. That at he the end claimed of the day, that. He wouldn't, he wouldn't tell us who his deep throat was. After all this happened, you know, I don't know, six months later, he finally told me who his source was. And he said, my source was Carl Rove. Now, I don't know if his source was Karl Rove. This is a guy who had lied to me repeatedly, and maybe he was lying again. But uh, that's what he said. And I don't doubt at all that he believed what had yeah. happened 100%. And I just have no way of knowing if it was true or not, and never will know. There's no way to know what happened and if it's true or not. We published a book that made an accusation that at the, at, at the end of the day, uh, we were told it was inaccurate. And uh, it was inaccurate. And shame on us. You pulped the book, right? You had to what? pulp. Did yeah, we pulled it and pulped it. We pulled. Yeah. It. We didn't yeah. have to pull it. We didn't have to pulp it. But yeah. I, we pulled it. I made a decision to pull it. The stores, it was selling like hotcakes. The stores didn't want to send it back. So I, we put in an incentive program. We paid them for them to send it back. Uh, and then we chopped up every copy so nothing. it wouldn't ever get out again. Such an interesting story around that book. Yeah, yeah, it was fascinating. It would, you know, and boy, stressful. Whew. Well, doesn't it speak to the role of, of lawyers, too? You believe the author, but like, you, you can't double check and, and research yeah. the research that the author does, can you? On no, every... no, the, the, the rules in, in book publishing are, you know, in newspapers, in magazines, the magazine and the newspaper own the story. And they're responsible for making sure it's factually accurate. But in book right. publishing, the author owns the copyright right. and they're responsible for it. And you can't fact, you know, how are you going to fact check a 400 page book to every detail? You can't do it. And so publishers yeah. don't have the facility to do it. In this case, there were days spent with James Hatfield getting him to say, just like with Michael Wolf and, and the Fire and Fury Bureau, you, did you, you said this, who did you talk to? How many people did you confirm it with? It's sort of a, you put them through a grilling process to try to get comfortable with are the facts right in this book, particularly if it's something that you can be sued for or that you feel that inaccuracies can be harmful. You work really hard to try to make sure it is accurate and you build up a trust for the author. Yeah. And we worked with this guy really hard and we built up a trust for him. And it yeah. turned out he either made this one thing up or it was true, but for whatever reason, he couldn't prove it was true, 
and he didn't have good enough sourcing and you know and did you sell the book back to him or yeah we he asked for yeah. the rights back we said sure and soft skull press published it you know six months later without a change speaking of uh, michael wolf trump sent him and henry holt the cease and desist letter and your response was to move up the publishing date yeah i like that this sort of prominent blogger wrote about it and said, you know, that's giving the middle finger to the president, which yeah. was basically the intent, I think. Yeah, um, I am winding down here, but uh, and thank you in advance for for indulging me like this. Oh, no, it's been fun. It always is fun. We won't go through the entire Amazon story, but you, it's a it's an exciting chapter in your book, if troubling. You talk a bit about windowing, delaying release by seven weeks of the ebooks and how important the pricing of ebooks yeah. and discounting of ebooks has been and your role in that. Maybe you could just, can you just give us a brief overview of your role in that? Sure. So what what happened is uh, you have the music industry gets goes through the digital transformation and within a year there's no more music stores in America. And it's very hard for most artists who can't do big concerts to make a living, right? So the basic whole structure of the industry falls apart when digital comes in. And then here it comes for books driven by Amazon. There were other eBooks before, but Amazon came in and really was the big player. And they demanded that books be available in eBook form on the date of publication simultaneous with the print book. And then they decided without talking to anybody in the publishing world that they charge $9.99 for all the big bestsellers. Yeah. And that, if you think about it, to the consumer who's used to spending, you know, 25 bucks for a hardcover, now it's $9.99. And that, that dollar amount is for the first release of the author's work, which is when it's at its most valuable. Same as movie, think movies, right? Same thing. First release, boom, big deal. Uh, and suddenly you're going to drop the price from 25 bucks to 10 bucks. And how's an author going to make their living? And how is a retail bookstore going to survive? So we were looking at all the retail bookstores going out of business and who exactly is going to pay authors like musicians get paid to show up and play. Who's going to pay authors to show up and read? Nobody. So at the end of the day, you look at it and you say, whole ecosystem is in danger of collapsing from this. And you won't be able to make a living writing books anymore. And so it was a very big deal. And my my role at the end of the day was Apple came to New York to talk to the publishers. And a few of us, as it turned out, three agreed to put in a different business model, agency, agency model? model, to leave the publishers in control of the price, not Amazon or the ebook guys, but the publishers in control of the price. Eddie got two other publishers to sign on. So five of the six big publishers signed on, Random House didn't. But I didn't think it was right to just, you know, have them discover that out of the blue. So uh, I flew to Seattle to tell them, you know, person to person. I was the only one who did that. And I was the first one who did it. And so I showed up and they, it was a very contentious meeting. And uh, I flew home and I had a message that I needed to call Russ at Amazon immediately, which I did. And he told me, we're taking the buy buttons down on all your books, um, which they did. Yeah. And it was, you know, front page news and Amazon yeah. versus Macmillan. And so by chance, I sort of fell into the role of being the guy in the front lines, right? It was pretty ugly for the next 10 days. And within 10 days, we figured it out and we had the contract and the model for the agency business with Amazon and the whole, then the whole industry switched over the next year, the whole industry switched. And now book publishers are in charge of the price of their eBooks. Booksellers are not. You see healthy bookstores everywhere, independent bookstores, chain bookstores. And that's partially because people still like the physical book more than they like the ebook, but it's also partially because one of the reasons they like it is the prices aren't that great, the disparity. Book lovers owe you. Oh, I don't, think, I don't think they owe I don't think I happen to be the guy who was in the crosshairs, but that was chance. That wasn't because I wanted to be. <laughs> 
Where are we at now, by the way? Uh, Amazon, there's the, isn't there Department of Justice coming up with some kind of Yeah, we also, you can, you can believe it, because the Department of Justice came against Apple and the publishers for sort of a, the Apple conspiracy to yeah. collude with publishers to set prices. We couldn't figure out what Amazon had 90% market share, 90%. Yeah. And they're suing us? For antitrust. <laughs> yeah. It made no sense at all on its face. And so that was a big, that was also a, a huge court case. It ended at the Supreme Court and, you know, it was a, it was a key deal. And, and at, at the end of the day, now the Department of Justice is coming after Amazon. Yeah. For the same points. Right. You said it cost you $30 million uh, in, in legal fees. Yeah. Cost our owner. Yeah. Cost Apple, I want to say 300,000, 300 million. Right. I mean, it's a big deal. Okay. Three more questions. Matthew Shear was wow. the publisher with uh, St. Martin's Press. Uh, he, he could sell anything you said, and he was able to get people to work together. So how do you do that? Well, he's very... Um, Matthew didn't need credit for stuff. I mean, he did. We all do, right? We all need a little credit for what we do. But his basic mode of operation was just to inspire people to get jobs done. And he was a very likable guy. He had this big booming laugh and this huge smile. He had a gap between his front teeth, big, huge smile, and just incredible, really loud voice and incredible amounts of wattage would come out of him. You know, when he <laughs> smiled, it was like energy beaming out of his head, you know? And he just loved books and he loved selling books and he loved his job. And he cared about the young people in the business. He cared about the talent and developing the talent of the, of the people he worked with. And he was all about having people work together to make the books work. And he wasn't about who's getting credit. He just wasn't. And so the, the kids at work adored the guy. Because mm. he treated them like adults, you know, and yeah. when they yeah. had an opinion, he listened and he would say, you know, OK, maybe you shouldn't bring that opinion up in this meeting. Maybe instead you should do this. You know, he'd help them. So he was just he was an enormously popular guy. And, you know, he, he died way too young and he worked right to the end. You know, the guy I remember talking to him, he's he, he's dying of, of cancer. And, and uh, I said, Matthew, don't don't you want to do something else? Your time left is in weeks and months, not years. And he said, I want to work. He said, I love my job. It's what I love to do. Yeah, it was lung cancer. And you you tell this extraordinary story about a remarkable dream that you had a couple of years after he died, that he was standing by your bed talking about how difficult it was for him to adjust to this new place. Yeah. Maybe you could just finish that story for me. Okay. So he, yeah. So I have this dream and I wake up and it's not like any other dream I've ever had. Right. It's not right. like it was the Matthew of old talking to me. It right. was Matthew today talking to me. And there was no doubt that he was there by my bedside. No doubt at all in the dream. Right. And when I woke up from the dream, I thought he had been in my room next to my bed. I mean, right. it was that realistic. And so Jen Enderlin was his best friend at work. Um, they worked together. They were very, very close. So the next day when I went to work, I called Jen and I said, Jen, I, I had this dream about Matthew last night and it was incredible. And Jen looked at me and she said, oh my God. She said, was he talking about how hard it, it was to adjust to the new place? I said, what? She said, I had the dream too. I said, wait a minute. How long did it last? She said, it was short. It was just him talking about adjusting to the new place. We had the exact same dream. On the same night, she looked at me and she said, do you know what yesterday was, John? And I said, no, what was yesterday? She said, it was Matthew Shear's birthday. I, I'd never known his birthday. I don't keep track of people's birthdays. She, of course, does. But you know, whoa, <laughs> it was, it was startling. It was okay, startling. John, John, what do you do with that? What do you do with something Don't like that? Don't worry about it. it, it you know, uh, I've had uh, three experiences in my life 
that are unexplainable that have to like that are just plain unexplainable. And I'm a science-based guy. Uh, do I believe in ghosts? No. Do I believe in hauntings? No. Do I believe in, but something happens every once in a while like that. And you say, well, there's something to it. I'm not going to understand it. There's nothing I can do to make it happen or not make it happen. But it's happened three times to me. And I don't have an explanation for any one of those times. I got no explanation that makes sense. And that, how how do we both have, she in New Jersey, me in Brooklyn, have the yes. exact same reading about the exact same guy. He says the exact same thing on his birthday. How, how does that happen? And so there's, you know, there's something out there. I think there's there's something out there that we as humans Doesn't have it? lost contact with that we probably had contact with a thousand years ago that we don't have anymore. Some other sense, some other something. There's something unexplainable out there, right? Things yeah. happen for reasons that science can't explain. And that's one of them. I, I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep trying to figure out what it is, but it's out there. And it's kind of pleasing that it's out there, right? Totally, it's kind of, totally. It's kind of nice. This is what people wish for after their loved ones die. They wish for some kind of connection. Yeah, some sign, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Your last chapter, you talk about your desperation to surf. Yeah. Um, you started at age 48. And then you talk about sea urchins and how they fuck you up. So how does a sea urchin fuck you up? <laughs> that was a guy. That was a that was an old Brazilian guy in Mexico um, who said that. But sea urchins are nasty, right? They they cling on the rocks. And if you can imagine you're going surfing, you fall off your surfboard and you hit a rock. If there's a sea urchin on it, they have spines. The spines have barbs. They get, particularly if you put your foot down on one. The spine is driven into your foot and it doesn't come out without being cut out. You can't pull it out because the barb, it falls apart in your foot. So they're nasty. So surfers do not like sea urchins. It's just a thing. Okay. And then this particular surfer really hated sea urchins, quite clear. <laughs> but it was an interesting, that, that story, that, that story was one of the reasons I ended up, I wrote that story. I wrote two or three stories before I started the book, way before I started the book, and that was one. I had such a remarkable day with my son that I decided I would try to capture the magic of a father-son relationship in a single story. And could I, without saying anything about the father-son relationship, could I, just by telling a story, a small story, explain the magic of the relationship between a father and a son. And so that was my attempt to do it. So when I wrote the book, I thought it's written different from the other stories. It's more, there's more emotion in it, or there's more, it's not emotion. It's um, the writing's a little more lyrical. It's meant to be that way. In putting more myself in the book, I thought it would be a good way to end the book was just the you know, the family, what's important at the end of the day? Is it all the work stuff? No, it's the family stuff. And how do you say that without taking out a club and hitting people over the head with it and saying, you know, well, actually, over all these years, family was more important than work and all that. Instead, I thought, let me just put this in to say, you know, how, what's important? And I did, I had a story in about my daughter, um, same thing. Yeah. I tried to tell about each kid why they were so important um, and why my relationship was so important. Tried to do it in a way that wasn't ham-handed and wasn't like my title, Nigel. Tried to do it in a way that wasn't like the title. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. As, what as fun. It has always been. Thank you. It's, it's always fun to be with you, Nigel. <laughs>